Welcome to the journals on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin, Hugh McDonald and Alison McConnell are here with me uh, to discuss issues domestically and maybe further afield as well. Thank you very much for your support on the journals programme. Your feedback has been absolutely superb. And if you want to follow PLZ Soccer on our YouTube channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you want all the breaking news at your fingertips, you can download the PLZ Soccer app as well. Uh, we'll be looking at the report card on the uh, Scottish Premiership clubs with the international break, obviously, in full flow. Uh, we'll look at the best players possibly with an opportunity to step up in the summer transfer window that are playing in Scotland at the moment. What about Steve Clark and Gareth Southgate? What will happen to them after the Euros? Is there a possibility that they might move on or sign a longer deal with uh, the international side. Certainly some clubs are sniffing around the international managers, especially if you are successful. Um, I've got uh, some uh, topics that I think will whet your appetite. One of them, of course, is uh, the offside trial, which is going on at the moment. Arsene Wenger had suggested it. We'll get the thoughts of Alison and Hugh on that. And then the top 10 greatest games. Um, I thought I'd... Get your thoughts on this on the basis that I witnessed Coventry against Wolves in the FA Cup at the weekend right and Liverpool against Manchester United. And it just kind of a, got the juices flowing on some of the great games that we've witnessed down through the year. So I'll get your thoughts on that. And we'll also discuss Otmar Hitzfeld's Dream 11 because it features a Scot. We'll get Hugh's thoughts and Alison's on that as well. It's me. Yeah, no, you're not no, in it. Just my thoughts. Just your thoughts. Oh. You're not in it because you're a poor touch on your left side. Um, anyway, what about the report card on the Scottish Premiership? We're in that break. Some managers will be delighted, Hugh, that they've got a chance to get some of their players back. Uh, but as I look overall, um, who do you think is the happiest? Team, set of fans and their manager? Come on. <clears throat> I think come on. Over the season. Mm hmm um, I think uh, Kamal will be under Derek McInnes will be I mean that one against St Murn at the weekend just icing on the cake the way they won that you know uh, the position they are in the league um, what they've achieved this season there seems to be stable base so I think they'll be they'll be really happy I think the Rangers fans will be much much happier than they were uh, you know what was it October uh, November, November time when the league was basically it seemed to be conceded by most people, uh, most Rangers fans saying, "Well, well, you know, if we can steady this year, and they've got a championship um, uh, uh, to to fight for." Uh, but I think Kilmarnock, St. Martin under Stephen Robson have continued good form. Okay, uh, they could beat at the weekend, but you know, good form, uh, and I think that would be just about it for really happy managers. Ali? Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, I'd agree with all three. I think Rangers will fancy themselves to go and win the league. I think uh, given the position they're in, obviously they're they're behind at the minute with, with that game in hand, given that the Dundee game was called off, but I think they'll fancy their, their chances. And given the way that it's turned, it's flipped since October, since Michael Beale, since losing that game at Ibrox, and then even losing the game at Christmas, I think a lot of people might have felt as though that was a definitive mm. point of the campaign that Celtic had flexed a bit of muscle again, came out of that one. We all anticipated that they would maybe spend and enhance the squad in January. I think the fact that, that Rangers remained cohesive since then, you know, they, they took the break, came back. Uh, I think they'll be pretty delighted with where they are, given where they were. Where they were. Kilmarnock, for me, is the, the success story of the season. You look at where they were last season, you look at where they were a couple of seasons ago, trying to get back out. The Championship mm. come up, fighting relegation last year back in that dogfight to be up and where they are I think has probably compounded the expectations of everyone around the club this yeah. season. Um, I think if I was picking two managers and, and two sets of fans for me I, I take the Kilmarnock uh, argument on board but I think when I looked at the away support at Rugby Park and I saw thousands of St Mirren fans there who are relishing what he's delivering for the second Aye, season that. in a row. It's not just a one-hit wonder with Stephen Robinson. It's, he's built a side, he's invested in the youth, he's managed to pluck a few golden nuggets mm. uh, to make the team uh, you know, even better. 
I think the St Mirren fans are buying into everything that he's doing, whether it's whether it's a situation where Stephen Robinson uh, could get a move uh, to a bigger club again. I don't want to kind of upset the, the buddies, but he, he's certainly done superbly well. And he's a very level-headed manager as well. Uh, and he knows Scottish football, so I think I think St Mirren to be in that top six again is absolutely superb. But ultimately, if I was looking at a manager that um, has the backing of the fans, the club's in a better place, uh, and they are less confrontational even at boardroom level, I would think Rangers are in a pretty good place to be tre- chasing a treble uh, in this season when it looks all but lost under. Uh, a coach who should never have been there. I think Philippe Clement's come in, he's level-headed, he's not got involved in the madness of previous managers. He kind of adjusts as a football man, organised the side. Suddenly they were in a situation where they were on this great unbeaten run uh, and they've bagged the League Cup. They've got a chance to win the league because destiny is in their own hands and then they've got a chance to win the Scottish Cup as well. I just think, you know, the disappointment might be... Europe, but I think most Rangers fans, if you are given them the option, you know, what do you want? Do you want the league title or do you want a long run in Europe again? They would have just said, no, league title. I think the only the only lingering maybe question mark over the European exit would be the fact that they played so well for so for, for significant chunks of that first leg yeah. over in Lisbon that they'll maybe feel as though they should have got through. But I think you're right. I think ultimately most people would, would sacrifice that for, for the league, for the title. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah, and the other thing about it is the way they've gone about their business and changed the way the team played. You know, for all the um, chat uh, and narrative that was put out there about how Michael Beale was a tactical uh, genius, you know, and was the real power behind Rangers stopping Celtic winning 10 in a row, uh, Philip Clement's come in and just basically inherited a side He's obviously been able to add to it, you know, uh, since then. But he inherited a side where he basically got them organised, made them difficult to beat, and then plugged the gaps and then got the best out of players that looked as if, you know, some of them looked as if they were on their way out. Yeah, I mean, I think the Lindstrom, for example, I think, you know, I think most people would have looked at Lindstrom under Beale and said, well, your tea's out. Whereas now, you know, he's certainly got a future at Rangers. I think... <clears throat> it's like that phrase where people use when you bring a grown up into the room. I mean, <laughs> it, it can calm things down. And right away, if you looked at uh, Clement's CV, you know, he had a, a bit of a turbulent time in France, we know that. But if you looked at his CV, you say, well, this guy's a manager. You know, he might not be successful at Rangers because you never know. But you can say, this guy. This guy has the uh, uh, the wherewithal mm-hmm. to be successful, <clears throat> and he's certainly done that by being cohesive, etc. I wonder, Peter, with the I saw some conflicting things about the the Dundee postponement. You know whether it was good for Rangers or bad for Rangers. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, I thought I thought the postponement was was at least decent for Rangers. Yeah. Uh, Even though they might have to play before have the to, Celtic to, to game. game. Yeah, because I just think at that point that the, the last few games, you can see that they've been running on fumes and, uh, you know, they've been beaten by Motherwell. They'd, you know, they've been beaten by Benfica. Injuries uh, still continue to occur. And I just thought... Was that the worst postponement? I know Clement quite rightly would say, no, I want the game played and the three points, but heavy part Dundee after an exertions on the Thursday, I think that the, 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 there was at least a potential for an upset there. Now, I know it never works out well because the downside is again, he's got to play uh, uh, before he plays uh, the big match against Celtic. Uh, but I don't know if it was the worst thing for them. Because yeah. um, I think... I think the, the the momentum in this title race is changing daily. I mean, more or less with Celtic with that double defeat, were you saying, well, that's a that's a title over. This is a team in disarray, a manager unhappy. Uh, obviously, things not right behind the scenes. Uh, but I don't think you can say that now. I think the I think the 
are they back on or my? It seems more stable. stable just really? slightly more stable. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think there's a dramatic turn, mm. but again, to counter that, Brendan Rodgers, if his team um, and that spark that everybody was looking for second time around hasn't materialised, they're still top of the league. But I think overall, you, you couldn't you couldn't count a minute because, as you say, there's been unrest in the background. The fans are not happy, mm -hmm. not just with Brendan Rodgers. Um, and then you've got players that really haven't been... Have, the, some of the signings have been disappointing. So I think that whole context of the story at Celtic, mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is not... It doesn't put them in any category here that we're talking about. Uh, one of the, the other sets of fans, I think, there's, certainly deserve a nod to their manager, is Stevie Naismith. Mm. Um, because this was a young man who's coming into a job, trying to convince everybody. I don't know if it's... I don't know if there's something about the Hearts fans in the last few years, you know, five or six years, where... You know, they're, they're looking for something else other than what Robbie Nielsen could provide or they have a, an identity-kept manager that they think they deserve. But Stevie Naismith was coming in and suffering similar, mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, grief that... Uh, excuse me, similar grief that Robbie Nielsen suffered, which is just this kind of an indifference, as if to say, well, it's only a matter of time before we round on him as well. Yeah, I think he had a job winning and over hearts and minds. I don't yeah. think there's any doubt about that. I think there's real criticism at points at the start of the season. They were pretty inconsistent, fairly inconsistent spell, but uh, since Christmas, I think uh, they've been pretty... I mean, that third place is all but... It's mm. sewn up. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, and I think all oh, two the manner of performances. There was some criticism about how the team had set up, the way that they were playing, that the football was pretty stodgy. Uh, I think all of those criticisms have been silenced, which largely comes through winning games. I think once you win games, nobody really cares about anything else other than that. Yeah, and of course, uh, you know, regardless of the circumstances of Celtic going down to 10 men, a 2-0 win at Tynecastle always goes down well. And, and they won at Parkhead as well. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, that's two signature results. I think the inconsistency obviously still continues. They can beat at the weekend, yeah. um, uh, and uh, when that that'd be a hugely disappointing result for Stephen because he'd be saying, "So oh, this is the kind of games we 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 should be going to Dingwall and winning," you know. Yeah. Uh, I think the Hearts thing is Hearts title. Everybody, everybody's got a title in the division. Livingston's titles to stay in the division, you know, Kilmarnock's title would be qualify for Europe, etc, etc. Dundee, I would presume, at the beginning of the season, would be stay up. Everybody's got their title. Our title is to finish third. Yeah. That is their title. That's what they are expected and should be doing, and they're going to do it. I think it really needs, you know, to, to win the Hearts fans over, because there's a hard crowd. It's the Glasgow Empire of, of, of crowds. Is, is you know get a good see if they, they got to a Scottish Cup final. Yeah, that'd be great. Can I just can I just uh, obviously I've got to try. There's there's oh, so many different well. generations <laughs> that watch the journals. There are young, uh, intelligent people watching the journals and thinking, right, it's the Glasgow Empire. Uh, okay, basically that means even the best of comedians mm -hmm. and best entertainers uh, in the olden days used to go to the Glasgow Empire, thought they were good, and they were roundly booed. Is that fair to you? Yeah, Des O'Connor <laughs> once went on and fainted. Yeah, I just looked at them and fainted. But the best one was Mike and Bernie Winter. When Mike uh, Mike Winters came on and, and to deafening silence and contempt, and the next moment his brother walked on and the guys the guys sitting to his music, F sake, or two of them. <laughs> That's the that's that's yeah. that's, that's Glasgow <coughs> And for the benefit of, again, another generation who lost to it, Mike and Bernie Winters were a TV comedy act. Well, they said um, they were comedy. And, you were, and you, were, uh, you were either into them or you weren't. Uh, it's as simple as that. But listen, if, you could, if you could make the Glasgow Empire crew laugh, uh. you, were, you were well on your way. You had something special. Um, so you're going for McInnes. Yeah, definitely. I'll say Rangers. Yeah, you started with McInnes. Yeah, I think McInnes, I think, but I think overall, I think Rangers yeah. fans just now will be sitting feeling pretty optimistic about what the season's about to yield. Yeah, I think Clermont for me as well. Um, as far as the, the, the Scottish Premiership is concerned, I was thinking over uh, some of the players and it will gather pace non-stop 
bit of hue about players potentially moving on. I wondered about the the best players or the players certainly, you know, up until this international break who have consistently shown quality and could be on the move in the season. The obvious one is Shanklin because I think he'll end up at Rangers. Um, but he's certainly one that has consistently caught the eye and there's been all sorts of speculation. But even with the speculation, the boy's just got his head down. He's a captain of hearts and managed to ride out the storm of where he's going to end up. Yeah, I have to say I was surprised that there was no bid in January for him. I think uh, I, I would take him to the Euros. I'd start him at the Euros. I think he's the most natural clinical striker that Scotland have. But I think uh, if he does go and feature at the Euros, that might change the complexion of interest around him in terms of putting himself in a shop window. I think yeah. it might just alert other clubs him, but certainly if you were going to ask me if I expect him to be at Hearts next season, the answer would be no. Mm. Uh, Shanklin's one, Miofsky's an obvious. Mm, yep, Miofsky, uh, although the, the heat around him has, has mm. dimmed slightly, uh, but he's still a good player. Uh, and and, and uh, Miofsky, when Jim Goodwin was there, uh, and Jim Goodwin told me in the January that Jim, the, the, the championship clubs were looking mm. And Mayovsky and looking at him seriously, and yeah. then what's that? A year ago, more than a year, fifteen months ago. So he's still he'll be very much in people's radar, even though the the, the club has the club's in a mess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're talking about we're talking about the report card for clubs that are doing well. There's a, a there's a few clubs in in, in that di in, in the division that are a mess, and I, I would say Aberdeen is a, the leading light because he, he, Livingston and are going down. But that that is not a shock. That's just it's the, finally the trap door is yeah. open for them. Shockers have stayed up, for, stayed so up for so long. Yeah, uh, but Aberdeen are in a mess at the moment. Uh, I know it was a, a good result of the weekend, but it, it, it's still a mess. But yeah, my off scale go as well in the summer. I think uh, the we all Dander the the, the Ross County player we know is moving to Hearts. To Hearts, he's a good player. <coughs> uh, great pass on him. Um, and I go back to my commander theme. I think there's a few commander. Well, I think can, there's a few. Danny Armstrong's in Armstrong, great season. Armstrong, Watson, and Mayo. Yeah. All three that I, I could see elsewhere. Stuart Finlay as well. Watson yeah. scored an incredible goal. I didn't he? Yeah, on, it was like, on, uh, it was like Messi. And you think he scored against Celtic? He scored twice against Celtic, Celtic this season. And he's yeah. tough. Yeah. There's a kind of resilience about yeah. him as well. And and he's, he's, also, I think when you're at that age, very young, still a teenager. You've got first team experience. I think people are naturally alerted. Exactly. So Lennon Miller would be oh, another one. Yeah. Well, I hope Lennon Miller stays at Motherwell. Um, he's got a he's got a really he's got a, a dad who's level headed Lee, um, who knows the pitfalls of, you know, the the fame, the adulation, the suggestions that you're going to move to a bigger club, uh, things that can you know basically derail your ambitions and derail your forum so he's advising him uh, and I think that's the best thing that Lennon Miller has in his camp is a, a dad who knows the score I want uh, him to stay at Motherwell maybe for another season I think Stuart Kettlewell who's certainly been on one of our programmes in the last couple of weeks suggested that the boy's settled and he knows what he's got to do so he, he's interesting one. comment from that programme actually when he said that he's still in the reserve in the he's still in the youth no. dressing room he's not in the first team dressing room yeah. it's quite an old school thing to do that you well, know just kind of keeping, was interesting as well. keeping people's yeah. feet on the ground a wee bit the bottom line is though Peter we've discussed this before uh, it's all well and good sitting and talking about hypothetical, but when someone actually comes in and says, you know, here's a huge contract to put in front of you and also the opportunity to go and play at a higher le level, a bigger club, possibly a better league, I think it's very difficult to say no. And yes. I think players, you can always say it'll come again. You just never know. It's such a fragile career yeah. that you never quite know. And I think uh, I think when there is a decision to be made, it's it would be very, very difficult to say no to it. And also, I think sometimes, you're never going to say it publicly, but for a club, sometimes that money can be so huge for a club to knock mm. back to because it, 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 changes be the land, it changes the landscape mm. hugely. Yeah, especially in Scotland. But I, I, I think an another thing I can hear, I can always remember it when Gordon Smith was an agent, he said, you know, wait a minute, they can break your leg. 
Huh? You know, it could be out. And then all of a sudden they're derailed. You know, I get all that. I it's, just it's just the, the sums on the pier now. You know, let's see, let's see, hypothetical a champion, a championship club comes in from, even leaving aside that Celtic Rangers might come in from the champ, championship club. Would ten thousand pounds a week be a, a ludicrous mm -hmm. offer from a championship club? I think not. It would be modest from so a I'd championship club. Probably say, so. Say it's ten grand a week uh, over four years. That's two million pounds. So yeah. you're saying to a kid, "Here's two million pound." I mean, that's life changing money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Listen, I I buy into all that. It's not been Achilles. And one to be maybe. fair, the other thing about it is, a lots of footballers <clears throat> roll the dice. Mm -hmm. It's a roll of the dice. I think but footballers have a certain mm. mentality. I think what you find from footballers is that they would always believe in themselves that they're uh, capable of going, I can go there and I can, that's I'll play. Go, that's how you play. go to Motherwell. Yeah. yeah. I, I can go in and I'll play. I'm not going to sit on the bench. I'm going to play. I back myself mm. to get into that team. Yeah. Yeah. So, William Miller, when he went to Manchester United, everybody yes. said, oh, he should have stayed at Celtic. What is he going to say to Manchester United? No, uh, excuse me, I don't think I'm good enough for you. Yeah. Well, what about Mikey Johnson? Huh? <laughs> but Mikey Johnson is. I'd love to. I think Mikey Johnson is one of the most interesting subjects in Scottish football. I would love to do get time to do what they call a deep dive into Mikey Johnson. A few years ago, I was at. This is a, a good few years ago. I was at a, a, a dinner with two guys, and I'll not name them because it was a. It was a it was a conversation at dinner, uh, and uh, but I would say very well respected in Scottish football, very well connected to what's going on in Scottish football and who's coming through uh, Scottish football. We know everybody from mm. 12, 13, coming through eighteen. And I said, "What's the next big thing in Scottish football?" Both of both without even Mickey Johnson. I said, "I've heard about this boy Billy Gilman or oh, Johnson, Johnson's." Johnson's going to be this, he's going to be that, he's going to be the next thing, he's going to be, he's got everything. Yeah. And then suddenly, he becomes the butt of yeah. almost jokes. You know, get him out, get him out. And then he goes somewhere else and suddenly he's a championship player and he's yeah. playing really well for West Brom. And West Brom will, will, will pay money for him. And I don't think he'll come back. No, I don't think he'll I come back. No. But it's, I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had, I think, about homegrown players and the pressure mm. on players coming through from academy structures mm. into first teams. You know, that boy's been at Celtic since he was a kid, went yeah. through the St Ninens programme mm. and Kirk and Tillock and into to Celtic. And you just think he looks as though a weight's been lifted mm. off his shoulders. You yeah. just wonder sometimes about having to go, there's a bit of freedom going elsewhere, away from expectation. I think so. Uh, I think the hardest thing is to do is like, and I, I've used Stuart Armstrong many times in this programme as an example, but I watched Stuart Armstrong for a long time at Dundee United, just the, the road I worked out, and I saw him about 10 times, you know, in, in a season. And the amount he wouldn't have got 10 games for Celtic yeah. that season. Yeah. Because he had three games where he was rotten, and he wouldn't have got back. Because they've done the United, they said, oh, we'll keep him on, we'll keep him on, we'll keep him on. Yeah. And that's the real big problem. You look at people come into mm -hmm. Celtic and Rangers as kids and where they go. I mean, I, you know, Celtic, you watch, I watched Ewan Henderson at Celtic. I oh, yeah. watched his brother Liam at Celtic. He was making a, 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 one's making a career in Belgium, the other one's making a, a career in Italy. It's just very, very difficult to, to, to get really in the team and stay the team. People forget Callum McGregor had to go away on you know, own. Yeah. The one other player that I, that I like, uh, and admittedly he's, you know, he's 28 now, is Blair Spittle, right. who I think is really you know, uh, turning it on. I love watching him because right. he's one of those midfielders who thinks the ball goes that way. Right. Um, I can split the defence with a pass. I can score really good goals. Um, I mean, I'm led to believe that uh, you know, he could be on his way to Hearts in the yeah, summer, I which I think would be a fantastic yeah. move for them. Uh, you, it's funny you talk about the ball going that way. <clears throat> Sometimes the ball goes that way. Well, like, oh, I love that. Yeah. See that, that arse he puts on yeah. the ball, he's just a great player to watch. He's yeah. one of these guys in Scottish football that <clears throat> we've watched them over the years. They maybe don't get, they need a wee chance. They get overlooked at times. They need a wee chance. Yeah. I'm thinking about even like the Andrew Shinnies at one time. Mm. Day. His career didn't work out the way he should have. I thought he was a beautiful player to yeah. watch. Paul Worth, another mm. great player to watch. Yeah. Uh, and I just hope that... This could be a nice a, move for him. That's what I'm thinking. See if he goes there. Better players around him. A team that'll 
<coughs> well, normally be on the front foot as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd wish him well because I like watching him. Okay, I think we've, we've got a fair reflection of, uh, and of course, Danny Armstrong for me is somebody Aye. that I love watching. It's a great season. Even last season, I thought yeah. he, did, he did a decent season last season too, but this year, yeah, I think he's been, been fantastic. Uh, he scored on. a really good, really quite important penalty. You look at the scoreline Saturday, yeah. you think 5-2, but that penalty Aye. that he scored to make it 2 each, and there was loads going on Aye. before it, and the... Uh, you know, there's all sorts of sledging going on before it as well, trying to put him off. He just kept his mm. kept his cool, really, really good penalty. It's funny when you yeah. say that word sledging, I automatically think of, you know, uh, Phil Tufnell and Shane Warren mm. and, and cricket. <laughs> <laughs> when you think of cricket, you think of the ultimate people who love the noise up, you know, uh, and sledging's, you know, yeah. crept into our game, oh, you know, when you can uh, noise a player up and derail them. Anyway, we've got a flavour of some of the players who will move on. Uh, you can give us your thoughts on that as well is there a player that you think can make a step up uh, on the performances that you've witnessed this season uh, there might be some in the, the disappointing uh, performances of the club but there's individuals who stand out we'd love to hear from you on that in the comments section below uh, you are watching and listening to the journals we're on every week of course we like to invite the odd journalists from the written press to come in and uh, give us their comments. It's great that Hugh and Alison are here and hopefully you're enjoying all the content on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. From players, what about managers? Uh, there are two international managers that caught my eye over the last couple of days because basically the Euros is fast approaching. Everybody looks at the managers and thinks, well, what are Scotland going to do? What are England going to do? Uh, the expectation level may be uh, vastly different um, but for Gareth Southgate I'm hearing you know links to Manchester United if he ends his uh, association at the end of this tournament with England mm. which by all accounts he's going to yeah and <coughs> uh, Ratcliffe there in, in, in Brailsford would be he would uh, I think uh, I think Gareth was some, a simpatico as they say a character to them and he's into process and he's into mm. Uh, he's into marginal gains. He's in, you know, he's a very open uh, manager to, to innovation. I don't think he's a Man United manager for I me. Don't, Is well, that outrageous to suggest? See, for me, I've got I've got to watch myself with him because you know, in football, you get very strong views about things, and then to leave them behind is a journey, you know. <laughs> and, and I've always got this thing about about Southgate is that. He's not a good manager, and this sounds incredible because he's taken them to a Euro finals. He's taken them to a World Cup. Uh, uh, it was a quarter final in the World Cup or semi final, and he took them to a semi final as well. So you say to yourself, "Well, you know, he's obviously got a good CV." But I think with that England team, every time they've beaten everybody they should be. And then when they come to a team that might, might be difficult to beat, they don't do it. Yes, and he doesn't change it. Like the Euros final against Italy, you could see Mancini was changing things mm. to get Italy back into the game. You could see England were just like falling out of the game after a period of dominance. Against France and Qatar, you could see the same thing. Against Croatia in the World Cup, you could see the same thing. He, that he wasn't um, a manager that was making decisions, that was changing the game. And by the way, if I think if he doesn't, and this is, here's, here's one, if he doesn't win the Euros, that's a huge, that's a huge blot in his, his thing yeah. because they are a good. They've mm -hmm. got. I mean, they've got problems at goalkeeper and centre half, right? Yeah. But that's some squad he's mm -hmm. got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, that's. A, I think you make a very good point there, Hugh, uh, because everybody can look and they'll say, "Oh, they got to, they got to a, a, a semi final and then a final, and then you start to look at the the the, the run they had." And it was only when you got to France mm -hmm. that you actually, you know, in that World Cup, that you actually thought, here is opposition mm -hmm. yeah. that mm -hmm. it could be troublesome. The rest of the time, it was, it was almost... It was a soft a, run. It was a soft run through, which, yeah. you know, the, the, the history books don't look at that. They go quarterfinal, yeah. oh. semifinal, final. Who did you play? I have to say, um, <laughs> he compounded some expectations for me. I would have to be honest and say I didn't think he was an England manager. Uh, I actually think he comes across very well. I like, I, I quite like listening to him, but I think that's very notable, and I think that is a sign of good managers mm. is being able to affect a game in game. 
mm. being able to sense and make the changes to keep yourself on top. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think that would, for, for me, if you're going to manage at the very top level and coach at the top level, mm. there's a certain uh, a certain <clears throat> tactical news that you need to do to affect games. And a decisiveness as well. Yeah. He's got to say, listen, I'm doing this now. Because if you look at them, if you look at that team, now, they've got the best right back in the world, right? Mm. Yeah. So, and they've got Stones, who in mm. central defence is a good player. They've got Rice, Bellingham, Saka, Foden, uh, Harry Kane. Come on. Yeah. Come yeah. on. <clears throat> can I, can I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, even, even, even getting to the European Championship final, um, you know, it's it's one of those things you're saying to yourself: should sh should they with the squad? My only my only defence of that is quite simply that some of the England players suffer from tremendous overhype. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that there's, they're, they're being elevated to a level that they're not really at. You know, people always look and say to themselves: Oh, these. These players are world class. A, a, a phrase that is mm. banded about easily, too easily for me, especially with a lot of England players. And I look and I say to myself, well, even in some of their squads, I thought, world class? Rooney was world class. Harry Kane's world class. But the supporting act is not as good as, as people were making out, especially the English media who were bumming them up to a level that I don't think they could I don't think they could I actually think that's justify a, it. A historical <clears throat> thing with England. I think every tournament in living memory mm. you, you 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 get a sense of that. I, and obviously as well, you know, it's not too long ago that you had the golden generation when you looked at the Stephen so Gerrard, Frank Lampard. Well, the golden generation was he? Yeah. I mean, they really underachieved, like perennial underachievers when you look it's at. It's still called the golden generation. Yeah, <laughs> when you look at what they had ah. and then you look at what the return was, mm. you think. Um, yeah, they're 74. Uh, World Cup squad was like that too. Mm. Um, I mean, we're slightly digressing because the ultimate thing here is, I mean, <laughs> I could go back, so, you know, 66, fine, they're on home home soil. 70, good squad. 70, should have, really Should have done well. Probably second best team in the world in 1970. Yeah. And, and then you could go start to really pick the bones on, on players that were hyped from 74 to 78 uh, to 82 with Keegan in mm. the game against Spain. Couldn't do it. Um, so they have suffered a tremendous overhype. But ultimately, for Gareth Southgate, I agree with you, Alison, on the basis that I think he's a thoroughly decent man. Um, I think he comes across really well. He's definitely a, a players manager because he backs them. He's yeah. got that kind of a Fergie-esque, mm. you know, you can have a pop, but I'm going to throw a, a protective mm. shield around them. But is he a club manager? And that's what I wonder after. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the Euros with them yeah. because for all intents and purposes, people are now talking about England should be winning it. I I, I, I don't think there's any doubt. I, I think England will be one of the favourites to win it. I think when you look at the squad that they've got, for me, they will be one of the favourites to win it. And I think if they don't, then no. I think there's a, 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 there's a, a serious... I think England should be. I think England their favourites. I don't think yeah. they will win it because I think there's, there's problems there in certain areas that he's not addressed. But if you talk about real world class, yeah. Kane's world class. Yes, he is. Uh, Bellingham's world class. Yeah. Yes. And I think Kyle Walker's world class. That's yeah. three in the team that I think. Mm -hmm. I think Kyle Walker's the best right back in the world. But I mean, yeah. that's three in the team that you could you could put nearly. And then you've got guys like Foden. Who's well, with all due respect, and I know I'm going to get got it get get it in the neck here for this. This is probably a separate program. Jude Bellingham is is getting to world class. Mm -hmm. Hugh, he's he's got to world class players are players who do it at the top level consistently. And, and you would have them, you, you, they make the difference. That's a world-class player. They make the difference. Mm. And, and I think that boy has got it all in front of him. I think that boy at 20, when he gets to this championships, I think people will be raving about him. But because he does it, he's got to do it. You know, I think, I think, I think just suddenly, you know, he's a brilliant player. He's top drawer. But now is the level where you actually say he's world-class because... He's won the Champions League with Real Madrid. He's helped England to do this consistently. You know, I think that's when you become world class. I, I tell you, I, I think he is world class in that, the, the, you know, and I can take your point because he, he hasn't 
But, but I think he's Real Madrid is going to win La Liga and they're going to win it because of him. Well, that's the, and this is the point. Definitely. That Just consistency at that level. Won much. Well, Kings won. <laughs> the, well, Kings won exactly. Well, a wee bit less than me because I won the Renfrewshire sure Primary School Cup <laughs> in 1967. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's won class. He's inarguably won class. Yeah, I think I think Bellingham. It's just a, it's just a wee nuance between the different. I, I think Bellingham's already there. Yeah, I think when you when you read about Kraus and, and and Modric saying he's the best midfielder at the club. Yeah, you go you, you know you go. Hmm. I think this. I think this tournament. This is tournament where he's going to elevate it. Well, he has, he has to do yeah. it here yeah. as well because. If he doesn't, and there's a there's a there's an argument for saying he doesn't because if he, he, he plays for Real Madrid, Champions League, La Liga, he's not going to come with a spring in his step yeah. to the Euros. Uh, the other he's thing, a young I, man. <clears throat> the other thing I was going to say to you is not just on that topic. It's we've managed to go off <laughs> uh, to different the different uh, tangents uh, because of Southgate. Um, a bit interesting to see. Uh, I think if England win the European Championships, it will be not only. Great credit to Southgate, but I also think it'll be great credit to the English FA mm -hmm. for 20 years of really putting that academy mm -hmm. through the money that they had at their disposal, but they put it into academies and, and they're reaping the rewards of it with, with those players. And the, the, uh, quite a lot of them will be players that were developed from that academy. So I think they'll be able to hold their head up high. Now, off the back of that, we have a manager who's got a, a nice little moment in time with a group of players who are playing, you know, quite a lot of them at the top level um, in England. And he's got a little clutch of players there who've got him to a championships again. Steve Clark, I wonder if the next part for him is I'm going to just, this is my last job, Scotland, or is there another big, is there a club job for Steve Clark? I don't know. Um, I think it's, again, I think it would probably depend what kind of, campaign that, that Scotland have. What success for Scotland this summer? Does it get him out of the group? He gets out of the group, he's got a bus and he's just uh, paraded down uh, every city um, in Scotland. I don't know if he would fancy the day-to-day -day of management again. You know, I think he's quite happy. He lives south of the border. I think he's quite happy. He's spoken before about enjoying a bit of time with his grandchildren and being able to, to do everything. I think international football has not got the same intensity, obviously, as day-to-day club management uh, but I think I think it'll be interesting I think if, if Scotland do well I think you might fancy staying on for yeah. the, for the if Scotland do well um, I think you know an English Premier League club might look at him again well, he's managed there before and, yeah. and he, he, he didn't I mean the West Brom experience said the bad, but he didn't do badly at West yeah. Brom yeah, the, the, the thing about him is he's a top coach and not only that everybody knows he's a top coach yeah because he's like, where football play, if you're looking for a new manager, you're going to be talking to people. If you're a Jim Ratcliffe, so I'm not saying he's too class going to manage, but if any manager or chairman is looking for a new manager, he, he tests the water. And if you go to, to managers to talk about Clark, they'll say, of course he's a top coach. Coach with Benitez and Mourinho, people that, that, that they're wanting, yeah. you know, Hula, Douglas. And he was with yeah. <coughs> and... and, and I, I, there was I mean, talk of the Celtic job, but I don't think he'd take it uh, if if Rogers left. I, I don't think I, I don't know the man uh, Steve Clark. Uh, I only had one long interview which which was about coaching, which is one of the most fascinating interviews, at least for me, that that I've ever had because he was so open about his relationships with like Kenny, mm. Benitez, Mourinho, etc. But anyway, my my gut feeling is. The age he's at, the money he's made, and the comments he made after the Command at Rangers game mm. about Scotland, he's definitely, I don't think, wanting to transplant his family up here. No, no. So what's Not in it for him? To. Yeah. What's in it for him? That's what I look. And only Steve Clark could look in the mirror and say, give a definitive answer to that. Yeah, interesting to see where both managers end up and what kind of European championships they have. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, news on uh, something that I think could actually, if it was implemented right across the UK, uh, and I certainly hope it is, it, the offside trial, which is ongoing at the moment, Arsene Wenger suggested that there has to be clear daylight uh, with this new offside rule, uh, rule. And basically, it allows clear daylight between the player uh, and the defender um, offside. 
So if you're in a situation where there's clear daylight with no ankle or anything, uh, you know, coming in on a, on a line drawn with a defender, um, then you're onside. So it would change, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people say it could be one of the biggest changes in the laws that brings more entertainment into the game. I'm all for it, Hugh, because I think we should start to look at the positivity of giving the benefit to the to the attacker who score goals. Football, after all, is an entertainment. Mm -hmm. So as soon as that line's drawn, if you see an ankle uh, in line uh, with a defender, mm -hmm. you're onside. So it will be a game changer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because Do you like it? It's got its downside. Downside is the faffing about, but it's faffing about at the moment yeah. anyway. I mean, uh, and uh, anybody thinks that it's going to stop arguments. Uh, <coughs> well, how do you define <laughs> clear daylight? Uh, yeah. uh, so you're going to get all that. On the principle of giving more yeah. to the attacker, absolutely. Because I think there's been... You know, I'm completely anti-VAR, except for matters of black and white, ball yeah. out of play... Um, uh, offside and uh, whether uh, goals. goals over the line. I hate it for everyone else. Don't think it should be there. But VAR's here. We've got to work for it. And if we're going to work for it, the good one thing about FIFA hang, uh, is that in the 21st century, the way that football has changed, FIFA made two really big decisions that has made football much better. And one of them was no tackle from behind, punishing yep. the tackle mm -hmm. from behind. And uh, the other one was pass back to the goalkeeper. And that changed, those really made the game much more exciting. <coughs> potential to make the game more exciting. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I just hope, I hope everybody embraces it and I hope it starts to come in. You know, I'd like to see it in from next season and, and uh, implemented in Scottish football because, yes, there is faffing about. I, I also think, you know, and I hope we don't go off on a tangent again here, but <laughs> I feel it's coming, um, is I, <clears throat> I hope there is a real change in, as Hugh mentioned, the faffing about, as he calls it. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to try and define uh, exactly what VAR is going to be used for. We've got to put a time lo limit on when it's used and the referee has got to be the, the, the main man. He's in control. The VR official is not there to even influence him. He's only there to say, have a look at it. We think you might have made a clear and obvious error. Here's where we think. And then they shut up. Yeah, I think you could dedicate a full hours mm. programme to this. Um, I think what you've seen across recent games and across recent months is a re-refereeing mm. at times of games with whoever's on VAR making those calls. I think that was never what it was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be to correct clear mm. and obvious errors. Now, off the top of our heads, we could all come up with half a dozen things that you would say, well, that's not a clear and mm. obvious error. And that game at Tynecastle, that Heart Celtic game at Tynecastle, you know, you could critique that for an hour on yeah. here. And that's just one game. Every manager will have a grievance about particular decisions that have gone against their team this yeah. season, some more than others. Um, but I think I think it's a headache for a number of factors. It's, it's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. And you need a consensus over what it's used for. How you get to that consensus is your problem. Yeah, and the, and the offside rule for me, um, you know, sometimes I think there's a stupidity around let's play it till the phase has ended. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy yeah. can break his leg by I'm that time. I'm going to say, you know? you're going to end up mm -hmm. one day with somebody getting a really serious injury when they've been, you could have called it back a minute yeah. earlier. You've and seen the other it so aspect, many times. Ali, it waste time. Yeah. It's, you're just wasting the other aspect of it, which I think all of us find tremendously frustrating, and the fans are the, the most uh, frustrated group in this whole debacle, is you never know when to cheer a goal. No, no I know, and it takes away the spontaneity, like the emotion around the game. You see it all the time. You see people, the first, as soon as you score, guys just glancing across mm. yeah. the line just to, to check. I know, I think, uh, I think that's one of the really huge drawbacks of it that we've seen. In terms of the offside thing, I think it's become preposterous. Yeah. You know, I, I think, think you're talking at points of like a toenail yeah. might be offside, you're not giving the goal. It's like completely against the spirit of what the game is. I think you should I think something that clarifies that such as this rule is common sense. 
it's, it's not going to be black and white. We're going to argue about whether or not that's clear and obvious, mm. clear daylight, or whether yeah. it's not. But, but I think if, I think as you talk about your brilliant catchphrase, faffing about, <laughs> it will certainly it will certainly quicken that process mm. up. Mm. If you can draw a line quickly and say, "Is there daylight there?" No, he's on side. Go on with it. Well, even in that alone, it's like, yeah. The thing about it is, I had a big argument once in, 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 about this with fellow journalists about VAR before it was actually introduced and, and saying that it goes against everything that, that football is about, right? And I know it was coming, it was a juggernaut, it was coming, but it goes against everything. Football is a fluid, fast game. Yes. That's what, it's not American football where you go from set piece to set. It's not even rugby where you go from set piece to set piece or tennis when the ball goes out and you've got another serve and you can look at it. The whole thing about football is fluidity. And it was going to be that. But the real important thing about football, to me anyway, was the fans. They're the guys that are paying the money at the gate. They're, you know, they're the guys that are, that, that, that are funding the game. And they're the people, men and women, boys and girls, who are creating the atmosphere. Yeah. And what I found, Peter, is quite funny. I don't do premiership games now. I mean, uh, I don't, I mean, uh, 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 I, it's only like, the only big games I go to is, is a punter at Naples. I went and watched them. So I'm down in the bottom where there's no VR. Yeah. And see that spontaneity of a goal going in is still existing there, and it's it's audible, Peter. Mm. It's not fifty thousand people. So maybe that was at Strand Rar, and, and, and Saturday, and you're talking about hundreds of people. But instead of going, I'm going looking looking, looking at my monitor. Is it, you know he's going to call it by? I think it was a shove in the lead up to that corner. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They're all running about demented. Yeah. It's a great <coughs> thing. Well, as long as you know. the Celtic Rangers women's game on yeah. Sunday in the first goal. I thought they were doing a, a foul in the, the, the build up and I'm looking to see it. But uh, then you think that's not, that's that's that doesn't that. exist. It's funny how your own, oh, absolutely. Uh, your own brain uh -huh. is unconsciously or subconsciously, you, you're already scanning mm, to yeah. see. Uh, the, ultimate, on? the ultimate thing is, though, that we were well aware. I, I, I think the speed of the game, the fluidity has been absolutely, you know, that has been the most painful thing uh, and it needs to be addressed. Um, but the one thing that you have to understand that every official in UEFA and FIFA highlighted getting a greater percentage of the big decisions mm -hmm. correct was the first thing. It was never, and I remember us talking mm -hmm. about it on countless programmes, it was never going to take away conspiracy theorists <laughs> because as soon as you have humans, whether they're on the park or whether they're watching the three angles on uh, the, the televisions that they've got, there is always a conspiracy theory and there's always this element of there's still human error and interpretation and the interpretation has absolutely huge. done everybody in. I do think, though, see if you're having to spend four or five minutes looking at an offside, give the goal. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. If you're really, if, if there's that... I think there's got to be a time limit, Alan. Yeah. You know, to get there in this five minutes is a nonsense. Um, OK, I don't want to spend too much time on VAR because it occupies every journal's programme <laughs> that we've uh, talked about uh, over the last few months. A uh, couple of things to finish, which I think are quite good. O off the back of, on Saturday and Sunday, there was a joyous uh, period where I think, you know, football fans up and down the country could watch great games in Scotland when you get a, a, a Kilmarnock, St Mirren 5-2. It is fabulous. And then, of course, if you're a fan of English football, which I am, uh, I watched Coventry City and Wolves in sheer amazement at the madness of it. It was a joy to watch. It was one of those... Uh, I always view classic great games as the ones when you're sitting on the couch and you, you, nobody's in your house and you're sitting on the couch oh my god <laughs> that's and, and you're shouting out and the Coventry Wolves game had that in abundance Sally I mean it swung one way then it swung the other way it was great yeah, I saw bits. So I saw like the last few minutes of it. Bizarre enough, I was in the press room at Rugby Park and someone had it on their phone. So I, I got to see the madness of how it concluded. Um, but yeah, I think so. And I think sometimes there's a reminder of why you enjoy it so much when you see a game like that. Yeah, and um, Liverpool, Manchester United yeah. just encapsulated uh, everything that. I never thought Coventry and Wolves would be topped over that weekend, but it was. Yeah, and, and again, it, it spoke to so much about football. Football's not a fair game. The best team doesn't win. Wins most of the time. Yeah. If you watch that Liverpool with Man United, you're saying Liverpool got it. There's Liverpool were 
I think well ahead, streets ahead of Man United to win. That's the beauty of football. Yeah. If you stay in it, you've got a chance. It only takes one break. It only takes with these players as well one chance. I was thinking when you were saying though, when you one of the signs is when you jump off the the chair in an empty house, and uh, because of my sad life, I, I do that all the time. <laughs> but I once did it as a journalist. And uh, it was at Motherwell, just uh-huh. down the road. It was my birthday as well, believe it or not. And it was Motherwell 6, oh. Bernie and 6. And it was 6-5, and the ball came over Jukovic's shoulder, right? And I was looking right down the barrel at him. And the only thing he could do was hit it into the top corner, right? That's the only thing he could do. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> and, and I got up. I just went up and went, oh. <laughs> I just, it was just such a yeah. instinct, and it was also a game where um, we were all uh, the great Ronnie Esplin, a great friend of uh, of us all, who's uh, a marvelous man and, and, and a really professional top journalist. Turned around to me and said, "It was six each. Six <laughs> each. I mean, we were all in that Vietnam thing. You know, like a thousand yards there. It was. I'm tightening this in. It was six each. Yeah. Then you go." I think so. It was six each, wasn't it? That kind of thing. So that would that would be one of the great games for me. I was at that game. I missed the Yukovic goal because a journalist stood up in front of me. <laughs> yes, um, but uh, I'm glad you mentioned that game. I, I'd written down some games that I think will forever be remembered from from uh, you know previous uh, history, whether it be domestic or indeed World Cup football. And you mentioned Manchester United. Manchester United, yeah. Bayern Munich, just yeah. lives <laughs> crazy. It's just the craziest. Yeah. It's the craziest one. I, I did mention Rangers four, Celtic four in this top ten. Uh, yep. Just from a Scottish perspective, on the basis that it's got to be the only time that both sets of fans cheered the teams off the yeah. field. Uh, both, both managers happy, and uh, both, I know, yeah, a complete aberration. <laughs> yes, absolutely, which is unusual. Man City three, QPR two. Yep, Aguero. Yeah, uh, another mad game. And uh, a man, a man who uh, is in the news for less savoury reasons, Mr. Barton, played a huge part in that <laughs> as well. He gets yeah. sent off yeah. when when Crystal Palace were winning the league for for the United. Yeah, and uh, so a huge twist of a game. Yep, Liverpool four, Newcastle oh, three. Oh. I remember where I, I was in the alley. I remember my son lying on the floor watching it on the television, calling more, etc. Just uh, magnificent stuff. Yeah. And, and and the great thing about that, and I, I know it's sad sometimes for Newcastle fans, but he, there was a there was just a, a moment in time as a player where Kevin Keegan was almost you could say the Messiah mm. uh, on uh, you know Dineside because of what he what he achieved with them, and then as a manager, they played a certain st- I, I, you know he's one of those times, Ali. I'm sure you'll agree. If Newcastle are on, you've got to watch them. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, yeah. But I, I think in some ways, though, it's a shame that his legacy is that interview. No. <laughs> you know that, that that's that's what you associate with Kevin yeah. Keegan's managerial reign, and for a certain generation. That's what you would associate with Kevin. Well, Keegan. I love Kevin Keegan so as a player, yeah. and I love him as a, I like him as a man as so well. I think so he's really, he's, uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing him. He's a yeah. really decent, brilliant man. I, the other. Thing I remember about that when Alice did the interview, goodness, I actually heard it the other day there when we were doing a, a YouTube rabbit hole as I do in my sad and, my, my sad and solitary life. But the other thing I remember was when when, when Colomore scores a winner, I think it was Colomore scores a winner, it, it cut. To Keegan, who was like, he just, he was slumped yeah. over it. And I said, that is football. I mean, that is just like, that is. Exactly. I mean, imagine nowadays when they call Colin or Banks, it's actually, uh, it's actually three each. <laughs> right, yeah. The volume's offside. In <laughs> and, and the 17th phase of play. I know. I've t- oh, by the way, it's a very good way you've liked the two I like that. That's why you're here, Obi Wan. <laughs> uh, I go back to see like the games as well. I think one of the things, because I'm so much older than everybody, is that. I go back to kid, games where I was a kid, where it was really important, you know. The, and one of the great games was Italy v West Germany in the 1970. I have World it down, yeah. Finals. Yeah, I've got it down, sure. Uh, it was 4 3 in extra time. After a sort of fairly pedestrian 90 minutes, it just went crazy in extra time. And also, the, the guy, one of my great heroes in football, one of my favourite players, Gianni Rivera, had a 
great input in that game because for a German goal he was on the line and it went towards him and he just didn't move and it went in the net. He, and you said, what are you doing? Yeah. But he went, a minute later, he went up the park and he scored this beautiful winner. So, I, and I was 15, it was a World Cup on the telly in the house. It was... Yeah. That, that was one of my. I think you forget games. as well. Like football wasn't so pervasive. You know, you didn't have games on all the time. So the World Cup was such a big deal because yeah. you had so many games being shown. It was so unusual. It was, you know, it wasn't like now where there's a game every night. Yeah, yeah. I only know the one game, Ali, but I I absolutely almost burst into tears uh, when I witnessed a game where it just didn't go. There's two games that stick in my mind that are really painful. Uh, and they both came in the World Cup. One of them was Italy beating Brazil in 82. Yeah, 3 -2. Paolo Rossi yep. uh, scored a hat trick and I did not want Brazil to go out. Mm. Um, I didn't cry at that one because it was in my mm. teens. Um, <laughs> and the other one was uh, France 3, West Germany 3. Aye. 3-1 the French team were just mm. brilliant and all the, and I, for the only time I've ever been negative in my life Hugh at 3-1 I said shut up shop uh. close the game down please and Germany threw uh, horse Rubesh I'll never forget him scored the winning penalty uh. and knocked them out uh, you know after extra time so many great games like yeah. uh, uh, Celtic Juventus the 4-3 four four three. Yep. Sutton's goal mm -hmm. yep. uh, and I've got down here let's not forget Argentina France yeah. the World Cup final yeah. greatest World Cup final I had to watch that on I had to watch that on uh, uh, replay because as the penalty shoot out of the World Cup final World Cup final I had attended <laughs> was going on I was standing in an empty Morrison's with Grace Kennedy McDonald, my granddaughter, looking for soap. She's got an obsession with soap. Yeah. So she demanded that we leave the house in the middle of the World Cup final and find her soap. So that, so I can't, That's not a grandfather's yeah. love then. That's a story you will constantly bring up to her. Darley as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, just before we finish, I thought, I thought it would be remiss of me not to mention, you know, I, I, I when 442 the magazine came out, mm -hmm. it was almost... It, must read for me. I loved the magazine and I collected the mm. first 120 of it and then you, you eventually ah. fall away. Uh, but they still have it online, which I think is... They still pr print it as a magazine as well, I have to say. But 442 is still a good read. And they do uh, something that we did as a programme, we still do, the Dream Team. Uh -huh. They do a Dream 11. And Otmar Hitzfeld is this month's uh, you know, selection. He has picked his mm. Dream 11. So I'm going to give you the dream 11 of Otmar Hitzfeld, who's <laughs> top drawer manager. Uh, Oliver Cannon goal, uh, Samuel, uh, Anderson, Matthias, Lisa Razou. These are players that he's managed. <laughs> Effenberg and Lambert are the holding midfielders. Uh, Mehmet Scholl just <laughs> in front of them. And then Elber, Riedler and Chapuisat. We could probably dissect every one of those players, mm -hmm. but oh, how proud Paul Lambert must be that for a glorious six-month period of his life, Alison, mm -hmm. he's named an Otmar Hitzfeld Dream 11. I, I, think he, I think that would be reflective of the esteem he would be held mm -hmm. in, not just by Otmar Hitzfeld, but in German football. Uh, I think uh, he's regarded as a really classy midfielder for his time at Dortmund. Obviously, of course, we know won the Champions League, but it's an incredible story when you go back and you think... It, it's, it, it's unimaginable. You just uh, an incredible story, but that it goes back to to what we talk about about pe people coming in for you and you back yourself to go an unfancied guy. <laughs> Who would have heard of you walking into that yeah. changing room and sitting he, down? He this wee guy Holland, from he flies to Holland and gets a, a trial for PSV outside right. Yeah, outside right because that's yeah. that was the position was up, and then the, the agent in Holland says, "No, I'm going to drive you just up the road to Dortmund and see if they'll have you." And in Dortmund, the Dortmund, the, after the first couple of games, the coach, I think he got a bit of luck. Sousa gets injured and that, and he, get, he gets his start. And he's watching Effenberg one day talking to, to, to not Effenberg, uh, um, Riedler one day talking to, to Hitzfeld and pointing over at him. And obviously, what he's saying is, we better get this guy in the team. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, 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 <coughs> well, he tells a great story of going in, like his <coughs> first sort of few days here, and they're, they're on a flight somewhere, and nobody wants to sit beside him. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I know, it is. A, it's a, down uh, is this it's a great guy tale. That's come in. And if you want to hear that story, it's mm -hmm. on Paul Lambert uh, <laughs> on our One to One series. Uh, uh, yeah. the Rolex and everything. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic, it's, it's fantastic the story. You can see that on our uh, straight talk one to one right. with Paul Lambert uh, on Bruce Dortmund. It, it really is well worth watching and listening to if you like downloading the podcast. Uh, yeah, it, it, listen, absolutely fantastic uh, to see him in that Dream 11. And even uh, Otmar Hitzfeld says, for six months, brilliant. I could rely on him. He's a cult hero in Germany. Yeah, it definitely and, is. And that is his, that, that's the best uh, you can get from one of your managers and a top drawer manager at that, Paul Lambert. Anyway, I uh, hope you've enjoyed the journals. There's been, uh, as ever, some bits of banter. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our chat and trip down memory lane with uh, vaudeville act Hugh McDonald um, and the, the, the great the Max Wall. Of the yeah, absolutely. And I, I just wonder at this point, as we leave the program, I wonder if in that day when Paul Lambert was strutting his stuff and Borussia Dortmund uh, defeated Juventus, I wonder if Hugh missed that because his son Ali wanted refreshers at the supermarket. <laughs> Only time will tell. We'll get him on that next week in the journals. Thanks to Alison McConnell. Thanks to Hugh McDonald. And from myself, Peter Martin, thank you for listening and watching.